This is a fantastic turnout for Pine of Science. Now, can I get a, a vague uh, idea of who the hardcore people are here tonight? So, Pine of Science has been a three-night festival. Who was here last night? Good. Who's been here all three nights? All right, we've got some hardcore people here. Who's never been to a Pine of Science before? Good. Welcome. Welcome. Come. My name is James. I will be your guide tonight through the ups and downs and the highs and lows of, of science and what that entails. Tonight, our theme is breeding better burgers. We're going to have a main talk by Dr. Sonia Dominic about the science behind livestock genetics. So I thought I'd start off the evening uh, with a couple of jokes uh, about the topic. Uh, stop me if you've heard this one. Two cows are in a field. One turns to the other, says moo. The other one turns around and says, I was just about to say that. No? Nothing? No? All right. Uh, what, what's, what's a cow's favorite type of film? A musical. Uh, <laughs> th 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 thanks, thanks. That was much more of a response than that deserved. No. As I mentioned, Pine of Science has been a three-day festival, not just here, but internationally. So these three days all over the world, everyone is getting together, celebrating science. Just here in Australia, it's happening across 16 different cities at, what is it, 32 venues. That's a total of 88 events where we're all getting together, celebrating two things that make Australia great. First of all, amazing science. Second of all, beer that doesn't taste like a urinal cake which is something that other countries haven't quite figured out yet. So, I'd like to propose a toast to science. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> now, it's important too that I acknowledge tonight we're meeting here on a Naiwan country. And it's really, I, I'm honored to acknowledge the traditional custodians and caretakers of the land and all their elders and communities past and present, particularly on a night like tonight where we're exploring and uh, really praising science, because what we do as scientists is we stand on the shoulders of giants. And it really was the traditional owners of this land that were the first you know, explorers and uh, discoverers to really find out how we live in this harsh landscape that we call Australia. Where our, our, our five minute speak speakers are all uh, PhD candidates. They will be given five minutes. They will be given this clicker, which they can go through their slides. And I want to point out that this clicker has the mother of all laser pointers on it. Ready? Ready? Watch this. Whee! Whoa! I know, right? It's pretty fancy. So, make sure to make them very, feel very welcome. And our first speaker is Venus Morani. Vitor, Venus, where are you? Come on up. And Venus is going to be talking about the legend of antiviral defense and sheep. Thank you. <laughs> Can I have the clicker? Thank you. <laughs> so good evening. I'm Venus Moradi, and I'll start talking about my honors project first and how I ended up doing my current PhD project. So during my honors year, I worked on a gene called MX2 gene in sheep, which has antiviral activities. And it's one of the many, many antiviral genes um, that are part of the immune system. So MX2 gene is not only present in sheep, but it's all, it, uh, present in all vertebrates, including humans, mice, and cattle. <coughs> in fact, cattle and sheep MX2 are 95% identical, which, is a, which works for, um, uh, um, which is a good thing for me, because if I find something interesting about sheep MX2, I could most likely apply it to cattle as well. So like I said, MX2 gene is an antiviral gene. And what basically antiviral genes do is <laughs> try to get rid of the viruses when they're trying to get into the cell and infect the organism. Um, so the gene has been studied very well in mouse, and its antiviral activity has been discovered. So it's um, acting against range of viruses. Got here. The gene has also been studied in humans. and it has anti-HIV-1 activities. But what does the gene do in sheep? And the answer is we don't know. And I'm trying to answer that question. 
um, it is important to know the function of the gene in sheep because if the gene is um, active against some kind of viruses in livestock, um, then the farmers could genetically select the animals that are um, that have the normal version of the gene and eliminate the animals that have the mutated version of the gene. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So I was very lucky to work in CSIRO labs. Um, so what we did, we got blood samples from 100 animals, and then I extracted the DNA from all samples. Then using PCR technique, I cut out and amplified MX2 um, gene for all samples. And this is the cool bit, and that's probably the coolest thing I've done in my life that I'm proud of. Um, I was lucky. <laughs> I was lucky enough to sequence my samples myself rather than sending them away to be sequenced. Um, so what basically sequencing means, you get to see every single building block of DNA in front of your eyes. And um, what I did next was to align the sequences with the consensus sequence and look for variations. Because sometimes if there is a, even a tiny variation like a letter of DNA being changed Oh. letter of DNA being uh, substituted with a different letter that can cause a whole lot of pr trouble. This picture might make my point a bit more clear. <laughs> so in bunch of animals, um, in bunch of animals we had um, one letter of the gene being substituted with another letter. Um, and that caused the production of a very, very short protein, which was most likely non-functional compared to animals that had the um, normal version of the gene. So this is the full-length MX2, which is produced by the normal MX2, if you like. And as we can see, the gene is doing pretty good. And this is the size of the MX2 protein that is produced by the um, mutated version of the gene uh, from the animals that had the variant form of the gene. And as we can see, the gene is non-functional. Uh, the virus is very happy. So, so this is where my honors project ended due to time and budget um, limitations. Um, but for my PhD project, I didn't want to do something different because I thought this is a full, um, this is a very cool discovery to um, find this mutation in Australian merinos, and I really wanted to keep going with the same project. So I started my uh, PhD um, January this year, and um, currently I'm in the process of making cell lines from both, um, both form of the gene, so the intact form of the gene and the mutated version of the gene. And next thing for me would be to test my cell lines against different viruses. But as we're all aware of high <laughs> levels of biosecurity here in Australia, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do that. So that's not an option for me. <laughs> so the next, the only option for me would be to um, travel over to Germany with my cell lines and test German viruses against my cell lines. Um, so during my, for my PhD, I'm not going to work only on MX2 genes, so I'm going to discover a few more, or work on a few more antiviral genes. This is only a few of them. I'm, I'm guessing there's going to be more genes down the track. Um, so ISG15, the lady in purple block, um, is, um, ISG15 is believed to be expressed very, um, in very high levels during early days of pregnancy in sheep. And what I'm trying to do is to develop a kit that um, detect um, pregnancy in like first few early days of pregnancy, maybe the three weeks of pregnancy. Um, so the farmers could test the pregnancy and if the animal is not pregnant, can, they can inseminate again, they have chance to do it again, rather than waiting um, to lose a cycle. Um, so this kit hopefully will be if I make it, it'll be um, easy to use in the farms, and there's not going to be any need for vets and expensive equi equipment. 
And thank you so much, and I hope this is not my audience. <laughs> Oops. All right, thank you, Venus. Thank you. Maybe the first scientific presentation I've seen with a pair of boobs in it. Uh, <laughs> let's see if our next speaker can one up that. I'd like to welcome Annika Alexander up to the stage. Annika, give a round of applause. I'll give you a wave in about two minutes. My name's Annika, and I'm a student at UNE, and I'm doing my research project with CSIRO. I'm going to give you a, a little taste of the project that I'm working on at the moment. Um, but before I begin, I'm going to assume that most of you here have felt stress at some point in your lives. And have you ever wondered what's happening in your body when you feel that stress? And whether it has an impact when you go and have your flu vaccine? Well, I can tell you that when you feel stress, whether it's from running away from a wolf through the forest or in the lead up to a talk like tonight, same feeling. <laughs> Your body releases a hormone, a stress hormone called cortisol. And cortisol in turn triggers a quick release of energy to get your body ready to respond to that threat. If you don't use up the energy, it stays in your system and you feel shaky and jittery. Now we know that sheep also release cortisol in response to stressful situations, like marking when lambs are given ear tags, vaccines, drenches, might have their tails removed, and weaning when they're separated from their mothers and have to learn to fend for themselves in the paddock. So researchers have actually found that um, cortisol, the stress hormone that's released when you're stressed, has an interesting impact on the immune system. Um, in the short term, say you're running for a bus that's pulling away from the curb, cortisol um, causes a release of immune cells to flood into your system and fires it up, um, getting it ready to respond to that threat. Um, but in the longer term, the same hormone, cortisol, starts to actually um, cause a downward trend in the immune cells, bringing them back to a baseline level. If, however, the stress lasts longer, so say you're worried about a life decision like doing a PhD and is that a good use of the next three years of your life, um, that downward trend continues and can lead to immunosuppression, um, which can leave your body vulnerable to um, disease and illness. And you might yourselves have felt, if you've been stressed or worried about something for a long time, you get sick more often, you might get the flu or just start to feel um, quite ill. Immunosuppression is also a bit of a roadblock in the pathway to successful vaccination because you need a healthy immune system to be able to respond well to that vaccine and create those memory cells that will help to um, defend you against any attack, for, or attack um, any disease that might enter your body. So my project is, is looking at three points. One, what happens when we vaccinate lambs at a short-term stressful event like lamb marking? Will the lambs have a good response to the vaccine because their immune system's fired up in response to that first burst of cortisol? Um, number two, what happens when we vaccinate lambs at the same time as a longer-term stress like weaning? Will they have a poor response to the vaccine? And third, why do we care? Well, lambs that respond well to vaccines are happy and healthy. And healthy lambs and um, healthy sheep mean a healthy flock, which can lead to higher productivity. And higher productivity means happy farmers. So that's a good chain of events. But how could you not care about the health and well-being of these little guys? Healthy, happy sheep and farmers. So, for my project, we measured the immune responses of lambs that were vaccinated at the same time as a short-term stress, lamb marking, and we, we measured the immune responses of lambs to a long-term stress, um, oh, sorry, at the same time as a longer-term stress, like weaning, and we also, also measured the immune responses of lambs that were vaccinated separately to marking and weaning. And I'm working through those um, measurements in the lab at the moment and hoping that the results will give us a good, a good indication of when to vaccinate and when not to vaccinate. And that's it. Thank you to all my supervisors and <laughs> cheers.
Thanks so much, Annika. And we had a, a sneak peek of her talk before, but now it's Narusha's turn to come and talk about meat ants and whether they can handle the heat. Oh, thank you, James. And uh, hi, everyone. I'm Narusha from Insect Ecology Lab at UNA. So we study different types of insects in our lab. We study about meat ants, dumb beetles, uh, stick insects. And uh, my interest is uh, of this particular ant species, which is called meat ant. So I study different biological aspects of this particular meat ant species and how temperature variations across northern tablelands will affect uh, these three biological aspects. Uh, it's the population genetics, behavior, and thermal tolerance. And will they be able to survive this heat in the future? So if you're not aware of what the meat ant is, uh, anyone know in this audience why they are called meat ants? Oh, anyone bitten by meat ants? <laughs> For sure. So the distribution of meat ants uh, pretty much uh, in the southern part of the country. It's a native species. Uh, once the ant species was used to biocontrol invasive cane toads uh, while back in Australia uh, because of their aggressiveness. They are pretty aggressive. Uh, they are like reddish, uh, brownish in color, uh, pretty big ants. And uh, if you know how to identify a particular nest of a meat ant, this particular nest is um, in front of Deer Park across the road. Uh, so the ant nest is devoid of vegetation. It contains numerous entrance holes, uh, constructed with pebbles, gravels, and twigs. And meat ants nest are most of the time construct close to a gum tree because they feed on the homopterans honeydew. So from the nest to the uh, gum tree, there can be uh, several uh, foraging trails where they forage. So uh, inside the nest, uh, sorry about this. I think some of the slides are missing. <laughs> Uh, can I, how can I go uh, the other, um, down one? Okay, anyway, so, so these, uh, these meat dance nets are uh, internally compartmentalized, so the genetically they can be diverse, and different um, queens can be present, which are not related. So in my project, what I study, uh, are these three biological factors, the thermal tolerance, population genetics, and aggression behavior. For thermal tolerance, uh, I sampled uh, ants from different populations, and uh, I observed the thermal stress. How tolerant are they? Uh, are those ants are prone to different uh, temperature variations. Uh, and the temperature rates, uh, and then how much they can tolerate the thermal stress. So for the moment, when I use 0.25 degrees Celsius per minute, that rate, they can survive up to 46 degrees Celsius in captivity. Uh, so when I increase the rate of temperature, the thermal tolerance rates will also increase. So. These ants are collected from different populations across the climatic gradient uh, in northern tablelands. So at the end of my study for this part, uh, I will get to know uh, uh, the population differentiation as far as the thermal tolerance is concerned, and also the population genetic structure of different populations. And the aggression behavior is also dependent on the temperature variation of these particular meat ants. They forage uh, very quickly during the summer seasons, and their activities are uh, very uh, low and during the cold seasons. So as I mentioned, that they are pretty aggressive species. And if you are exposed to a meat ant nest, if you're disturbed, they will uh, come in large numbers and bite you. And as well as they are pretty aggressive against their uh, conspecifics uh, from different nests. So this particular slide, a very short video, she will show you uh, 
attack in ants, this particular one ant from a different nest is attacked by some other ants uh, from a resident nest. So uh, they are pretty aggressive. And uh, even when I was videotaping this, I was attacked by several ants, <laughs> to be honest. And uh, so I'm really, I'm used to uh, their bites at the moment. So it, it takes a lot of efforts to have this video done. And uh, so you may have known about ants as annoying species, and they bite you, they can be pests, but ants have ecological importance as well. They uh, uh, are very useful in uh, aeration soil and actually uh, doing uh, uh, seed disposal. So make sure that you know the positive things about ants as well. And this study at the end will uh, use uh, my findings as a template study uh, to predict uh, the uh, other ant species survival in the future in other parts of the world as well. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Narusha. It's funny, it actually reminds me of another joke. Uh, <laughs> what did the Pink Panther say when he stepped on a meat ant's nest? Didn't, 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 didn't. All right, Jeff, where's Jeff? <laughs> Jeff Kirkland is our next speaker, and I have no idea what this talk title means. I'm very care keen to hear what it's all about. Right. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm very excited to talk to you guys today. Um, I'm an environmental chemist, and as an environmental chemist, I'm always excited to explain things you see every day with chemical detail. Um, thank you, Erica, also a chemist. Before I get started in, into my talk, one of the big things in chemistry is making very precise measurements of quantities. So before I go into my pint of science, we need to be a little more specific than that. So there's an imperial pint, which is equal to 568 milliliters, or mils. But if you go to different parts of the world, like the US, and you ask for a pint, you're going to be slightly disappointed because you're getting just a little bit less beer. But if you go to Quebec, or maybe even France, and order a pint, that actually refers to a quarter of a gallon. <laughs> and you'll be quite surprised and pleased with that volume of beer. If you go to South Australia, they might tell you, if you order a pint, they might give you 450 mils, unless, if there's any South Australians, you specify, I want an imperial pint, and then they'll give you the appropriate quantity of beer. So for my talk, I'm going to serve you a imperial pint of science. <laughs> And my topic is, how do we suspend water and air? So I said that I, I like to explain things that we see every day with a little bit of chemical knowledge. And the big thing about this is that you make observations, and you probably already know everything that I'm going to present to you. But hopefully, you'll have a deeper understanding by the end of this. So there's three key ingredients to suspend water and air. And the first thing is gas phase water. I think. Australians are pretty well known around the world for their tea consumption. So I'm sure we're all familiar with boiling water in our kettles domestically at home. So that's an evaporation process. That's creating gas phase water. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. The second key ingredient is a surface to condense. And I think we can probably all identify with recent mornings when you get up early and you go out to your car. If you walk through the grass, your shoes are already wet. And if you get in your car, you might have a windshield covered in moisture. OK, so that's water from the gas phase condensing on those surfaces. The third key ingredient is a change in temperature or pressure. So anytime you go and you turn on the weather channel and you want to know how cold it is on any given Armadale morning, you'll see the meteorologists come on, and they're doing a lot of hand-waving motions telling you that there's fronts moving in. There's pressure coming through, and you're going to get different temperatures. And it's a lot of hand waving that's trying to give you some deeper understanding of why the weather is the way it is in your local area. But the trick to all of this is that we're going to take our surface, and we're going to suspend that surface. And that's going to be how we get that moisture condensing in the air and suspended in the air. 
So the way we do that is with particles. So just to touch on each one of these things, water in the gas phase is in constant exchange with the Earth's surface. So from surface waters, local lakes or rivers, and even out of the soil, when the sun comes out, it starts to cook the surface and it's gonna evaporate some molecules and they'll escape from the liquid phase in the soil into the gas phase in the atmosphere, okay? So that is temperature dependent. If we think about the sun, that is a big flaming ball of gas that's gonna heat things up around here. The second thing is that, that surface suspended. Does anybody know of ways to get particles in the atmosphere? I'm sure we all know these things. Does anybody wanna throw out a guess? No, everybody's too shy. They didn't think they would have to answer any questions today. Um, so there's heaps of examples. And one example would be bushfires. So that's a natural source of particles in the atmosphere. We have domestic fires, another source of particles in the atmosphere. We can go further and think about combustion in our fuel tanks, producing some particles and gases. Even further, we can think about combustion at power plants. We can think of cuter things to, that produce particles, but pet dander, anybody that has a family member with allergies will tell you that they have some sensitivity. It's because there's particles landing on their olfactory nerve in their nasal cavity, and they're sensitive to that. Other things like pollen, so seasonal variations in those that that particle count in the atmosphere. You can have sea spray. So if a wave crashes down on the coast, it forces bubbles under the surface. And as that bubble comes back to the surface and bursts, you get a little sea spray particle that's formed. So anytime you walk at the ocean and you feel that there's some sort of mist or saltiness in the air, that's because there's some particles from the crashing waves. There's also sandstorms. So in India recently, uh, there was a sandstorm that came through. These are very serious things and sources of particles in, the, in different regions of the world. And then volcanoes in Hawaii recently. Volcanoes spew gases, lava, particles. So there, it's so easy to find sources of particles in the atmosphere. And then cooking. Anytime you cook at home, it's another source, kind of combustion where you're changing, it, performing some chemical process and generating particles. So with that, we'll move on from our particles to our third step. And I think the important thing with our third step in thinking about this temperature or pressure change is to bring it into a local example. So you might notice, or you might be able to tell from my beautiful depiction of Armadale, <laughs> that we have North Hill and South Hill. And there's going to be an air mass that can get trapped in between those two hills. So in the valley in Armadale, where we are right now. Um, you'll have water in the gas phase, so the sun might come out and it starts to cook that surface and you get that water moving up. And it's in the gas phase, so you're not going to see it, but it's there. During the day, it just accumulates in that air mass in between the two hills. Now, I think in the winter, we're all familiar with some of the combustion processes, so that can force some of those particles into that valley. So now we have our first two ingredients. Can anybody guess the easiest way to get this third ingredient to come into play? Everybody's still very shy. That's OK. <laughs> Maybe after a few beers. Um, so if we get rid of that sun, all we have to do is transition from day to night. You get rid of that sun, and we stop cooking the, the surface of the Earth. So now we just have gas phase water surrounding these particles. And once that sun goes down, slowly that water starts to condense on the surface of those particles. So as it gets cooler and cooler, maybe that water accumulates, and by the time you guys wake up the next morning, you can't see a, a thing. So that, you might think, well, I don't mind the fog. Why does that matter? Why is it relevant? But particles and gases in the atmosphere have global implications and impacts on the environment. And a few of those things include visibility, if anybody's tried to have a flight out of Armadale at 6.30 in the winter, I think you can identify with some knowledge of fog and how visibility plays a role. The other thing can be climate. So particles tend to have a net cooling effect where they reflect uh, heat from the sun back into the atmosphere. 
Air quality, again, that sensitivity, you might have a family member that has seasonal sensitivities to the particle count or the um, particles that are present, the types of particles. Health, that relates to the air quality example I just used, but it can also be ecological health. So particles can have carbon and nitrogen and a host of other nutrients that maybe we emit them here, but the particles can move with an air mass and be deposited elsewhere so that Maybe if it goes to a local lake, you get this algal bloom that can happen. So things suspended in the atmosphere become very important, and I get very excited about them. But the next time that you wake up and you see a very foggy morning, I want you to be thinking, what kind of particles are those in those <laughs> droplets? So with that, thank you, and I hope that was an imperial pint of science for you. It was a little bit more than an imperial pint, Jeff. <laughs> Moving on, do we have a Russell in the house? Russell Bignall, who's going to be talking to us about horseshoe crabs. Fun fact, they're neither crabs, nor do they make effective horseshoes. Where is Russell? Here he goes. Take it away. All righty. Forward, backwards, pointer. Awesome. Cool. All right, yeah. Good evening, everyone. My name's Russell. I'm a PhD student in theory and paleontology, sort of also biology, and yes, I'm a Kiwi, so apologies for the accent. All right, so what are horseshoe crabs? Well, he just ruined, like, this slide. So they're not actually crabs, nor are they horses, and you probably could wear them as shoes if you really gave a go, but they're probably not shoes either. What they are actually are these guys here. So today there are four species of horseshoe crabs, but... um. They have a really extensive fossil record. It goes back about, I don't know, 480 million years. So before the dinosaurs, these things were doing their thing. And today I'm going to talk to you about what I'm doing with these guys. To give you some background of what's led me to construct what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to give you some research that I've done. So these are horseshoe crab teeth. Yes, I cut them in half and I looked at the insides of their teeth. I've chucked them in a CT scanner and then turned them into pretty colours. I've doused them in iodine and looked at their muscles and then turned those into pretty colours. I've done some really funky, crazy, insane, over-the-top, slightly alcohol-inducing analyses that have resulted in some nice, pretty, colourful pictures. And that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> well, what I would have shown you there is an example of injuries on horseshoe crabs. There we go, look at some more injuries. So those are injuries to the tail of them. I have looked at injuries on fossil specimens. I have cut them up. I have shoved four sensor things into their mouths to see how hard they can bite down. I have looked at baby ones. And yes, I've conducted a scene from Hamlet with these things. <laughs> now, <laughs> together, this insane exposure to, honestly, some of the weirdest, strangest, craziest animals I've ever come across has led me to my current insane project. I am building an atlas of all horseshoe crabs. That may sound like an easy job, right? There are a hundred species of fossil and alive horseshoe crabs. Most of these species have never actually had photos taken of these things. So what I've presented you here are some drawings from basically anywhere between the mid-1800s to the early 1900s. We want to actually see what these things look like with a photo. So I'm going to pull all of these species into one place. This really hasn't been done in ages. The last time someone sat down and went to lots of museums and took, well, made lots of drawings happened in the 30s. So that's, you know, what, 70, 80 years since someone's actually done that. This will actually set the standard for what a horseshoe crab is. So there's a lot of issues around what a horseshoe crab actually is because they look similar to other things in the fossil record. So in putting everything together in one place, hopefully what I'll be able to do is say, that's a horseshoe crab, that's not, deal with it. Come at me, reviewers. <laughs> and what this will do is it will sort of make UNE a center of horseshoe crab research, which is slightly weird because horseshoe crabs are known to only America and the Asian countries. So we don't even have them here, which is a shame. And believe it or not, this is kind of fun to do. 
So what have I done? I've read a lot of books. This really doesn't give you an idea of how many books I've read. Just imagine, I don't know, half the Amazon rainforest. I've chopped it down, turned it into printing. That's how much I've read. I've emailed a lot of people. So a lot of museums have specimens of these things. I mentioned there's about 100 of them. So that's, you know, let's say 50 museums I need to email to bug for images. I haven't traveled yet, but I'm going to be traveling later in the year to the States. And as a result of all this, that says I'm a third of the way collecting these images. I'm actually about half, so between when I sent this in and today, I've got another few images, which is great. And the outcome of this insanity at this point is more emails, so bugging a lot more people, and um, I drink a lot of gin and scotch these days. So to give you a nice summary of where things are at, I've sort of selected some of the highlights of our fossil species. So they sort of have this, this commonality in the sense that they have that lovely domed shield, and then they've got that weird bit on the end, and then a tail. But this actually presents basically the variety of how weird these things got. So we have a range from the, I'm going to give this thing a go, haha, <laughs> awesome. So that up there is one of the very few Australian fossil horseshoe crabs, which is, as far as I'm concerned, completely weird. And we have a range of that thing right through until something that has basically needed to be reconstructed in 3D because of the way it was preserved. So the research at this point is, I'd like to say, going pretty well, but I've still got another 50-odd specimens together. So that's actually my talk. It's a little bit short. Apologies. Um, and so I'd like to thank the Pine of Science for putting this together and um, basically everyone who I've sent emails to. Uh, my co-authors for putting up with a lot of emails, my supervisor for not completely vetoing the idea, and UNE and other places for funding my research slash my alcoholism. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. That was actually a perfect five minute talk. It wasn't short at all. And I'm so sorry I stepped on your punchlines. It's MCing 101. We have our final rapid fire talk, and it is none other than Lachlan who I believe is talking to us about footwear fashion. Great. Yes, all right, take it away. Absolutely. You can tell by my Chuck Taylors, I'm really into uh, footwear fashion. They're dirty and they're probably covered in some sort of manure. Um, okay, I've got a, a livestock joke, if you want to hear it before I start. Yes. It's a bit of a dad joke, and I'm a primary school teacher, so this is really lame, but here we go. Um, what do you call a cow with no legs? Ground, Ground beef, yeah. <laughs> Wasn't too bad. All right, so yeah, my name is Lachlan. My talk tonight is called Game of Crocs. Oh, that's better, sorry. I'm not talking about the daggy footwear. I'm talking about crocodiles. Or more correctly, I'm talking about crocodilomorphs, which is the larger group that contains crocodiles and all their extinct ancestors. So in the hit TV show, I'm not so subtly ripping off here, there's a famous quote that goes something along the lines of, when you play the Game of Thrones, you either win or you die. Well, when you play the Game of Crocs, you either win or become extinct. <laughs> um, so the setting is the Cretaceous period, which was uh, one of the periods of the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, so at the start of the Cretaceous period, the continents all look kind of squished together like this. I'm focused on Gondwana, which was the southern continents that we know today. Towards the end of the Cretaceous period, the Earth looked a little bit more like what we used to. So let's take a quick trip around to each of these continents and find out what's happening at each of the great croc houses. First one is House South America. So the crocs in South America, the biggest croc army to date, uh, over 50 species have been named just from South America from the Cretaceous period, uh, ranging in size from the tiny Susi circus, only about 60 centimetres at full growth, right up to, remember this, might be in the test, the enormous Sarka Circus, which was about 12 metres long at full growth. It's a big monster. Second great croc house is House Africa. Uh, second biggest croc army as well. Over 30 species of crocs identified from this part of the world. Some weird and wonderful things were happening in croc evolution in Africa at this time. Uh, we've got Stomata Circus here, which was a nine metre croc that had a gullet like a pelican that probably used for catching fish. Um, then we've also got the other Saurus Rex, Machimasaurus rex, which was the largest marine croc to have ever existed. Next great croc house is Madagascar. Now, we actually have found a few croc fossils in Madagascar. 
This one is by far, oops. This one is by far the most uh, important and interesting. It's a croc called Cymosuchus. It's been nicknamed the pug croc because it's got a short, flat face. Um, it was also covered in armour and had teeth that indicate it was probably a herbivore. Herbivorous crocodile. Let that sink in just for a few seconds. <laughs> Second last great croc house is the house of the subcontinent, uh, India and Pakistan. Now, we haven't found many fossils here. Uh, this is an example of one, a croc called Pabwishi. But what we do know is that the fossils we find here have ties between Africa and South America. So it's adding a bit more keys to the puzzle of croc evolution. Final croc house is, of course, House Australia. Uh, to date, Australia only has one identified, confidently identified uh, species of croc from Cretaceous, and this is a guy called Isis Fordia. Isis Fordia lived where that star is, which is now the Queensland outback town of Isisford. Uh, although, in my research, that's Isisford, uh, in my research, I've actually discovered that Isis Fordia also lived here in Lightning Ridge, which is in New South Wales. How did I do this? These two fossils here were key to me discovering Isis Fordia living in two different locations. Uh, the first one there is in the upper jawbone, which 100 years ago was actually wrongly diagnosed as a lower jawbone belonging to a completely different species of crocodile. So I fixed that. The second one there is uh, part of the brain case, which is the back of the skull. Um, this fossil is really, really cool because there's features in that which allow us to pin uh, these fossils uh, completely to Isis Fordia without a doubt. Why is this important? Well, the fossils that uh, all the crocs I've spoken about, they all kind of fit loosely into this family tree here. They're all extinct, except for this group up here, called the crocodilia. We call that the crown group. Uh, Isis Fordia sits here at the base of that family tree. So in other words, Isis Fordia is the oldest known member of the group that contains living crocodiles. It's the grandmother of all living crocodiles. So its bloodline still exists today in two species of gharials, two species of alligators, 14 species of crocodiles, and six species of caimans. It's a pretty impressive bloodline. I've only got four kids. <laughs> so, who wins the game of crocs? Well, in my opinion, Australia wins the game of crocs. It's pretty clear, actually, that Australia wins the game of crocs. Isis Fordia wins the game of crocs. <laughs> <laughs> because its bloodline still survives today. And seeing this isn't a TV show, we don't need to wait two years to find out how the story ends. Well, all right, can we just thank one more time all of our rapid fire presenters? We have had some science, now it's time to have the other side of this event, it's time for some pints. We're gonna take a five minute break, head to the bar, stretch your legs, and we'll be back to hear from Sonia. And we'd like to welcome Dr. Sonia Dominic. Now, Sonia, uh, you and I have a lot in common. Uh, not only do we have strange accents and apparently go to the same hairdressers, uh, <laughs> but we, we have a passion for high protein diets and, and how to make them more, more effective. And you're a quantitative geneticist uh, from UNE and with the CSIRO. I'd like to make her feel very welcome, Dr. Sonia Dominic. Take it away. Thank you, James. It's actually exciting if someone in, um, announces he has doctor normally that only happens when you board a plane. <laughs> welcome, doctor, you sit on somewhere. <laughs> So thank you. Um, I have to correct you on one thing. I'm, I'm an adjunct with UNE, but I actually work with CSRO. So I'm the team leader of the quantitative genetics team. We work in livestock breeding um, with CSRO agriculture and food. And most of you probably would have seen when you go down the, towards Urella, 20 kilometers down the road, that's where our field station is. We've got about 40 staff members. Um, and it's a, a working property of 1,500 hectares with uh, 8,000 sheep and about 300 head of cattle. Next to research in genetics, we also do research in health and welfare, and Danila talked yesterday about virtual fencing. 
uh, and also we develop measurement technologies for livestock. So I was quite excited when this call came around to put your hand up to talk. I went to most of the talks last year and as well this year and I think it's a fantastic opportunity to actually share some of the work that, that you do. But I had quite a selfish reason as well to put my hand up because I want to improve the barbecue conversation for quantitative geneticists. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Kim. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> Just to give you an example, I'm, I'm standing somewhere at barbecue with a friend of mine from zoology. Someone comes over and says, what do you do? My friend says, I work in some endangered species. And they go, oh, that's so interesting. It's about the genes and how they're not adapted to the environment anymore. So I get quite excited because I think yeah, they're going to get what I'm doing. <laughs> They go, oh, what do you do? And go, oh, I, I work in livestock breeding. And then I just get a, ble a blank stare and I go, do you clown? <laughs> I'm sure some of you might have thought, oh, I wonder if she clowns. And she doesn't clown. <laughs> she doesn't clown. She doesn't genetically modify or gene edit. So I'm a computer based scientist and we develop tools for livestock breeders to uh, select their best animals for the next generation. What actually drew me to this, drew me to this topic um, is the genetic diversity that we have in our livestock. And again, I think that the zoologists, well, zoologists, they got a bit of an advantage because everyone loves the genetic diversity in our wildlife, but I think the ge genetic diversity in livestock is totally underappreciated. We got, if you Google cutest sheep, you... <laughs> get that top left-hand corner, which is the Valet black nose sheep. <laughs> then we have some more bizarre breeds, like the Jacobs sheep with four horns, which is actually a really old breed. There's nothing sinister going on. So I didn't find why someone decided to breed for multiple horns, but I assume its horn had well, sort of a sign for power, so they thought if it has four horns, it's more powerful. Um, so. It was actually just a natural occurrence of multiple horns and they breed for it. So they can have four to six horns. We got our Scottish Highland, um, but we also got breeds that are adapted to the nutritionally poorer environments or warm env environments like the Brahmin, the Dorper sheep. So there's a lot of fascinating breeds out there. You might have driven down the highway and seen a mob of Angus cattle and you think, well, there's no other cattle anymore. They're all just black cattle everywhere. It's no diversity. So hopefully today I can give you a bit of a taste for what sort of a diversity there is and the difficulty of the task that breeders actually have to differentiate between the different animals to work out which are the genetically best to select to pass on the best genes to the next generation. So we've got a pretty diverse audience here. I know there's a few colleagues of mine from the university and from AGBU, and hopefully they get a bit of a laugh at times. I don't think they'll learn much, but I hope a lot of you will take something home as well. Now, we start right at the beginning. One single gene. We got all night. <laughs> there's a lot of genes. So there was... Uh, a monk in Austria, Mendel, and some of you might remember Mendel's peas. So he loved peas. And he was actually the first person who sort of developed the notion that there was a single unit that um, determined what offspring of a cross would look like. So he did lots and lots of crosses and looked at various characteristics of peas and worked out the rules, um, what these crosses would produce and what sort of... Um, what, what their genes would look like. So in this case, we look at two peas, a yellow pea and a green pea. They carry a gene for colour, which we indicate with a C. And these two are crossed, probably as well, for explanation. So the yellow pea, each pea carries two copies, not two copies, carries two versions of of the gene. One um, 
and it's called allele. So one allele comes from mum, one allele comes from dad. The yellow P has two yellow alleles. The green P has two G alleles. When they're crossed, they pass on one allele each to their offspring. So all the baby P's will have a Y and a G. Now they're all yellow, even though one of the parent is green. Now that's what we call recessive. Green is recessive, yellow is dominant. And it's a bit like rock, rock, paper, scissors, so you don't actually have to remember the words. Yellow just always wins. Yellow is dominant, yellow wins. So if you now cross two of these P's that carry a Y and a G, you get a range of different baby P's. Some get two Y's, some get a Y and a G, and we get a green P that gets the two G's. So these three on the left are yellow because they carry at least one copy of the yellow. Yellow always wins. <laughs> now we move from the colour of peas to the colour of sheep. The colour of the wool is important because only white wool can be dyed and the merino sheep is highly selected for white wool. However, every now and then you get a black lamb in your people get black lambs in their flock, which are undesirable. Now behind, oh, can't actually see, but I'll get to that. Now behind the colour, um, there's one of the genes, it's called the agouti signalling protein gene. And there's trivia questions too, so, <laughs> <laughs> just saying. <laughs> So we call it as well the ACIP gene. So in terms of what was the C before for colour, we got here the A for the colour gene. And the white sheep has two copies of, uh, two alleles of white, whereas the black gene, uh, the black sheep, you can't see, has two copies of black. The black is recessive, the white is dominant, white always wins. Now, we require some audience participation. There's some cloud-looking things on your table. They're actually little sheep, so they're black and white. <laughs> Fantastic. So I will show you some crosses, and you will have to give me a show of sheep if what colour the offspring are going to be. So here we have two white sheep. They both carry two alleles of white. We cross them, what colour are the offspring? Excellent. <laughs> I was actually offered to throw a stubby holders, but I thought it was a bit dangerous. <laughs> Much as later. So that's great. <laughs> it was an easy one, warm up. Now, an unlikely cross. We got a white sheep and a black sheep. The white sheep carries two copies of white and the black sheep carries alleles, not copies. <laughs> Otherwise, it gets confusing later on. And the black one carries two alleles of black. What colour are the offspring? Fantastic. I must be really good <laughs> at explaining things. So, one allele from each parent. The offspring will have one white, one black. White always wins, so the sheep are going to be white. Now, this is a bit trickier. We got a sneaky sheep here that actually carries one copy of the one alleyo, black alleyo, <laughs> and one white alleyo. It's white because white always wins. So we don't actually know that, like, we couldn't tell, but just by looking at the sheep that it carries a black alleyo. The other one has two copies of white. What colour are the offspring? It's too easy. <laughs> So they all got at least one copy of white, and white always wins, they're going to be white. Now we have two sneaky sheep. Ooh, this is a hard one. <laughs> they both carry one allele of white, one allele of black. What colour are the offspring? <laughs> That's exactly right. So we get some black ones, and we get white ones that carry at least one copy of the white, and they're going to be white. So that all seems to be pretty straightforward. And CSRO actually went on the quest at some stage to develop a genetic test, to then test, to work out, 
because you can't tell from just looking at these animals that they carry the black, how do we identify them and how, are we, um, how can we select against them? However, it's actually not that simple. So the black sheep has the two alleles of black, has one single copy of the ACEP gene. White sheep have actually two copies of the ACEP gene, or three, or four, or five. So there's multiple copies of the same gene, one after the other, only in the white sheep. So some of the copies can then have the black alleles, but because if they have one white allele somewhere, white always wins and the sheep are going to be white. Because of that complication, we don't actually have a test yet. Um, there's other characteristics that are influenced by single genes, like horns in sheep and cattle, um, and also disease traits that we got tests for. But yeah, the end of the story for the black sheep, he well, there isn't actually an end to the story yet, so we haven't developed a test yet for it. Now, knowing a little bit more of some of the things that can actually go on um, in something very simple like colour, um, it might give you a bit of a different appreciation for what you actually see in this paddock of, of Angus cattle. Um, more importantly, we now actually upscale. We don't go to its two genes. We go to thousands of genes. <laughs> so the characteristics in, in livestock that we're mostly interested in um, are growth, reproduction, uh, meat quality, wool characteristics, and they're all influenced by thousands of genes. So we need a tool that actually captures that um, because whatever is we see in the paddock is a combination of the genes and the environment. So the job of a quantitative geneticist is to basically collect a lot of data, throw it in the computer and try to get strip all the environmental effects away and get a good picture of the genetics of a particular animal. To explain that concept, I pick a trait which is height. I'm a very tall individual. Got a bit of an environmental effect happening there with some heels. Um, but we don't know if I'm genetically tall or maybe in the year that I was born in, there was something in the baby formula and all kids that were born in the same year actually grew really tall. So we don't know that. So we look at my parents first. This is me before I went to James' hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my parents are actually fairly tall. Um, we can assume, yeah, it, it might be a genetic effect, but I wasn't actually a single child. I have a sister who's on the left, who she just started school at that age, well, at that um, time, <laughs> and she was six years of age. So that's me on the, on the right there, there's Granny and my mum. I was quite clearly three years of age, and we were the same height. So we got the same parents, we do have the same parents, we share 50% of genes. So maybe I just got a whole different set of genes for height than my sister did. Is it genetic? Is it still that baby formula effect? We don't know. So we might look at some unrelated friends. That's me and a friend just starting school and the same friend at a little bit younger age, probably again three. Um, that's me in the yellow jumper, my friend on the left and my sister is with a striped jumper and her two friends. So as we can see, an unrelated friend of mine of the same age is quite short. So baby formula certainly was not the cause for my height. So we can assume it was a genetic effect. I just got a whole different set of genes for height than my sister. No, 50% different set of genes from height for my sister than my sister. Um, so if I would have been really prolific, I would have had a basketball team, whereas my sister would have had a bunch of jockeys. <laughs> and that's 
pretty much the same concept that we use in livestock. We produce a tool called estimated breeding value. And what that is, is a picture of the genes that animals carry that they're then going to pass on to their offspring. So what you see in the paddock is a combination of the genes and the environment. We get information on the genes on the pedigree of these animals, on relatives, on unrelated animals and their performance. And we get other environmental information, the age of the mother, what paddock they grew up in, were they male or female. We strip all the environmental effects away and we get a picture of what genes these animals carry. Another, um, another job of quantitative geneticists is actually to include novel technologies, advances, um, to get an even better and more accurate picture. So what better way of actually doing that to go straight to the DNA? Genomic has been a very um, very um, has been a, an area of research that produced a lot of great results for human medicine. Um, and a lot of times, livestock breeders kind of look over the fence and go, oh, no, no, I wonder what they're doing. I wonder if we can do similar things. So if you, for example, Ancestry.com actually offers um, a service where you, you send off a saliva sample and you can get information on your ethnic background. And it works very similarly in livestock. You send off a bunch of tail hairs or you send off a blood of a blood of drop of blood on a card and you get a um, genetic profile on your animals and you can actually infer relationships between the animals, similar to Ancestry.com. The advantage of actually doing that with the DNA information is that we now know that siblings don't necessarily share 50% of, of genes. We can actually evaluate relationships much better. So we can use DNA information plus the environmental effect, well, we strip the environmental effects away, but we use DNA information and we get genomic breeding values. So where we might have an estimated breeding value or several animals with the same estimated breeding value, they can have different genomic breeding values because we actually got more information to make that differentiation. Genomic information is really powerful. And just to finish off, I want to share one other story with you. Um, a producer approached us and, and sort of came up with the problem that he bought a few bulls from, from a stud and he was wondering, the stud was in quite a different environment to his environment, obviously lower stocking rate, um, temperature was different. So these bulls produced a whole heap of daughters and he wondered which one of these bulls actually produced daughters that were, had really good reproduction and which bull produced daughters that didn't have very good reproduction. So this particular producer did not collect any pedigree information. So he had the daughters and he had the sires. So what we did at the time of pregnancy scanning, when the daughters were brought in, they were scanned not pregnant or pregnant, so we knew they were reproductive or not. And we took a blood sample and we put the blood sample together and got a DNA profile on that pool of blood. We also got individual DNA profiles on each of the bulls. And then we did sort of a bit like a forensics exercise. So if you actually have a pool of blood at a crime scene and you have three possible contributors to that blood in the crime scene, you can actually work out who contributed. So that's a very similar approach. So we have one pool of blood of non-reproductive non non daughters, one pool of blood of reproductive daughters. And through comparing um, the pro DNA profile of that pool and their size pool and that pool, we could work out which sire actually 
had the daughters that were pregnant. So it was really important information for this particular producer because he could then say, okay, this is the bull that, that I want and this line of size, we want more of that. It's also quite important information that could go back to the breeder because this is a performance in quite a different environment to what they actually see in their own herd. So I'm finishing off here. I've taken you on a little bit of a journey from one gene to a thousand genes. I've told you a little bit of what quantitative geneticists do and the challenge for you at the next barbecue you find that quantitative geneticist and you walk up to them and you say, I know what you do. <laughs> <laughs> and you have a friend for life, I trust, <laughs> trust me on that. <laughs> so if you want to know any more science stories, CSRO is on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. They send pretty cool stories through. And that's the wrong way. And then I'll finish off and we'll have questions later. Thank you. Thanks, Sonia. Now, I once heard a story about a cattle breeder whose cows got out and broke into a nearby field of marijuana. It was a tragedy. He couldn't sell any of the meat. The stakes were too high. <laughs> uh, anyway, how about we do some trivia? Uh, we should also announce you put in all your votes for our rapid-fire speed talk, and we can announce the winner of that. Braden has got the prize that we're giving away to our Rapid Fire Speed Talk. This is an iPad brought by the School of Science and Technology at UNE. And the winner is... Not here tonight. It is Alan Izzy who did a great talk on Monday. So round of applause for Alan. We'll get that to him any moment now. <laughs> you, but you all did wonderfully tonight. Well done. It's a very close race. Now, I'm going to uh, open the floor to questions. Here's your chance to pick the brains of any one of these scientists. We have a roaming microphone. The Michael's going to bring around, so stick your hand up if you have a question, and we'll bring it out to you. Anyone? No, sweet, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> for a second, you have to ask a question <laughs> and try and think of something. We got one up the front. <laughs> Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what was the smallest crocodile that ever lived? I don't know. <laughs> um, the one that I mentioned uh, as a comparison to the other South American species, so Susie Circus, uh, was only about 60 centimetres at full growth, um, so just over half a metre. Um, that's pretty small. Um, sure is. There's a, it was also a croc called Micro Circus, so I'm assuming that guy was pretty small too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but the, I guess the, the longer answer to your question is that um, there was a massive, massive diversity in crocs in the extinct forms than what we see now. So there were, as I mentioned, crocs that were herb herbivores, um, some that were omnivores, some that were carnivores like we know now. Some lived entirely on land, some were semi-aquatic like the living ones, some spent their whole life in the water. Um, those ones that were really small, those ones that were really big, those ones that lived in trees, those ones that lived in burrows, um, covered in armour. Yeah, the list goes on, and I could just ramble, but I won't. Um, but yeah, so there was lots of different ones, and their diversity was probably, at the time, probably rivalled the diversity of some of the dinosaur groups. Um, not now, though, because we've got birds which are way more diverse than anything else we know. All right. And birds are dinosaurs. <laughs> good, good. Important take-home message. <laughs> any, any other questions? Oh, we've got two over here. More diverse except for fish. Was so it fish Jeff or Russell that did the atmospheric particle? That's, that's Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Jeff. Um, does cloud seeding, does it actually work? Cloud seeding, like geoengineering? Trying well, to create crowd create clouds. rainfall. Um, so that there's kind of a delicate balance there. If you have in in the atmospheric field, there's cloud condensation nuclei. So if you have very fine particles and a whole lot of them, 
the water vapor that's in the atmosphere will condense, but it won't grow to a large droplet. So you'll have a lot of tiny droplets present, and it might not rain is, the, I guess, the appropriate um, parallel there concept to consider. So if you try and inject massive particles in just a few of them, maybe all of the water will condense and you'll get these giant droplets. So sometimes when it rains, you get this mist that takes forever and just lasts forever. Other storms might have these massive droplets and it might be due to fewer particles in the atmosphere when the storm developed. So all of the water condensed on fewer particles, so you get these larger droplets. Um, I think I've effectively, effectively avoided your question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, what did you ask? <laughs> well, does it work? Because um, I'm from Tasmania, and um, they do cloud seeding in the southwest to fill all those dams in the Franklin. Okay. And then the uh, graziers on the east coast are complaining that there's no rain left for them, and that they're actually going to stop the rain cloud seeding in the southwest. So my general perspective on any sort of, and it would be geoengineering, which typically refers to trying to modify the Earth's systems. And that generally is a bad idea. Um, I don't know the specific case in Tasmania. Maybe there's probably smarter people than myself that came up with this plan. If it was a group of politicians that were driving this plan, maybe not. Um, but in theory, you could inject the atmosphere with particles and get that water to condense and try to get it to rain out. In practice, I'm not really sure how it works. So what you're saying is the movie Geostorm is not scientifically accurate. I think I'm saying no one knows <laughs> Geostorm, <laughs> the movie. <laughs> I, right. Is that... You haven't seen Geostorm? I've never oh, you'd heard love of it. Geostorm. Oh, check it out. Okay. It's showing on planes currently. <laughs> um, hello. I've got a question about estimated breeding values. Um, so currently estimated breeding values are calculated per herd, so as in per stud. Do you think this is an effective way to choose um, breeding animals, so bulls, when purchasing them in? as they are not representative of the total population of that breed. So it's, it's a very good comment. Well, actually, um, they, they are representative of the breed. So the system breed plan basically incorporates all the information, say, from all the Angus cattle, um, from the Angus studs, and estimates the breeding values. So, um, whatever stud might have sold a bull to a, another stud and they got offspring. So that's all recorded, that's all linked. So it's actually representative across, across the, the breed. Thank you. All right, there's one question just back there. So now I'm just wondering what the appropriate response I should make now at a barbecue when somebody asks what I should do. Um, have you answered that question for the general public that what quantitative geneticists do is mathematical and not biologically maniacal? <laughs> yeah, I hope the takeaway message was that, that we sit at a computer <laughs> and stare at numbers. We don't own a lamp card. They don't let us into the labs. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly a lot of people think when they hear genetics, they think about reproduction. So that's, I don't know, that seems to be the logical thing. Um, so yeah, please, everyone, computer-based scientist, find that person that's standing quietly in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the quantitative geneticist. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I have a question. How do cows do maths? With a cow calculator. <laughs> I got more of these, so somebody put your hand up. <laughs> One more. <laughs> Hi. 
Just wondering, um, Russell? Yeah, this one. Yeah, okay. Kiwi, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so your idea of an atlas, why doesn't it exist already? Because it seems like this is a pretty, you know, typical fossil form. We've all seen this in museums, so I'm sure you're super smart, but there must have been super smart people before, so why is this atlas new? I wouldn't say I'm super smart. <laughs> I'd say I'm really dumb. Uh, and <laughs> the reason why I say this, and the reason why it hasn't been done in ages is because there's been no one who's been stupid enough to do it. <laughs> so, to give you... <laughs> um, and honestly, if I'm to be completely honest, the idea came about when I was drinking um, <laughs> and talking to my friend overseas. Um, and to give you an idea why it really isn't done is because I've sent, in the last, let's say, week and a half, about 80 emails to various people who don't want to be emailed about specimens that they described 30 years ago, or museums that don't want to be emailed because that means they have to do work. So in an idealized world, I'd have a private jet, and I'd basically go to these different places and take my own photos. But what about, I know in herbariums, um, the new trend now is to uh, digitalize all the specimen. Is it something that's going on in paleontology as well for the specimen? Yeah, they're not dinosaurs, so it's the less sexy part of stuff, to be honest. Um, some museums have gone through their type collection, so the special specimen, and taken photos of them. But because these aren't particularly... Interesting. Because they don't have a backbone. Because <laughs> they're not a T-Rex. <laughs> um, and because a lot of the collections actually have been moved from place to place, no one's gone through. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> We're friends, can you tell? <laughs> no one's gone through and systematically taken photos. Shut up. Of all of, all of the uh, important species. But I mean, when I saw the tally of your talk, Horseshoe Crabs Through Time, I, I assumed this was going to be a boring talk because we're taught from day one that horseshoe crabs haven't changed for millennia. Tr true or false? What's going on there? <laughs> well, when you say millennia, you mean thousands of years, and that's probably correct. Um, but if, <laughs> but in the, I suppose, geological time scale that horseshoe crabs have been on Earth, so almost half a billion years, they have gone through quite a few periods of doing weird and wacky things. So they are sort of the traditional example of halted evolution, but only if you consider things that are anywhere between 20 million years to 2 million years old. Anything older than that, they've done strange things. Like, like what? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> one particularly good and potentially overstudied example is a species that was arrive, uh, arose in the Carboniferous, so back 300 million years. This is also pre-dinosaur, I believe, yes. Um, and this particular species is thought to have been able to climb trees. <laughs> so horseshoe crabs today don't climb trees. Um, in fact, they almost never go out of the water. They only go out of water to breed. So basically, in their, the time that they've been doing what they've been doing, they, they've done a whole lot of weird different things to try and capitalize on these different environments. All right. So, yeah. Good. They're I like weird. it. <laughs> Any more questions for a panel? <laughs> really? Nothing? Oh. Oh. <laughs> so I'm thinking about the game of crocs. <laughs> yeah. And there's a lot of extinctions going on. Yeah. And so I'm interested in whether ice ages have caused any of these extinctions and whether the crocs were afraid that winter was coming. <laughs> do you want an answer or do you just wanted to make the joke? What's, what are we? I'm, <laughs> I, was, I, I probably should have ended my talk like that. Because <laughs> it's a much better ending. <laughs> um, do, do, do you want like a, a sensible answer or a silly answer? Um, <laughs> If you uh, okay, so ice ages didn't technically cause any extinctions that we know of. Um, extinct. So there's been several great extinctions through the history of the Earth. 
Um, and the one where a majority of these croc species I was talking about, um, they were wiped out at the same time as the dinosaurs were about 66 million years ago. Uh, the current consensus is that was caused by the meteor impact at the Chicxulub uh, crater in Mexico. Um, that was the, one of the catalyzing factors of that extinction event. Um, but that wasn't the biggest in all of history. Uh, the biggest one happened at the end of what was called the Permian period, where there was over 90%. Tom, tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah, good. Um, so, yeah, over 90% of all living species died out at the end of the Permian, which was... How long ago was that, Russell? Oh, yeah, sometime. Yeah, then. <laughs> Sorry, Tom's got the right answer. 252 million years ago. There you go. There you go. So, 252 million years ago was the greatest of all extinction events. Um, yeah, so that was pretty bad for those involved. <laughs> You had to be there. Um, so then the ice ages, the ice ages, the earth has gone through several ice ages through its history as well. Um, and they've all been um, kind of happening after some of these great extinction events because the earth's climate changed due to the factors that these extinction events um, created, such as, um, so the medial impact caused a lot of tectonic activity, which increased the uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, increased the heat of the earth, and then cooled down and blah de blah blah Is that good enough? Winter's coming. <laughs> Actually, it's here, it's really cold. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have time for two more quick questions. No, I have a question for Venus, actually. This uh, MX2 thing, uh, it was attacking, it's attacking HIV. We didn't really get time to go into the actual process of it. Yeah. What's the gene actually coding for? And how is it killing HIV? Oh. And do we know, I think, <laughs> is a good question. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure about the exact mechanism. Mm. And <clears throat> the thing that's been done so far is only on... Um, in cell culture, not in actual human. Yeah. So it's, it's work on cell culture, but um, not in real human yet. So well, I guess you just have to wait uh, for All a right. clinical trial. So you're back here next year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't work on humans, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll come back with some sheep uh, messages. <laughs> That's fine. Sheep are great. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> If there's nothing else, I'm going to have to ask the final question. All right, did you? Oh, go on. <laughs> yeah, fill me, eh? <laughs> so what I know about paleontology is from reading a Bill Bryson book. Good start. In which he says that, uh, I think it's something like, um, the fossil record is only a tiny proportion of the species that ever lived. Yes. So how do you know there was a mass species um, extinction if you don't even know the species existed in the first place? Do you want to do this? Uh, uh, we can do it, both do it. Uh, all right. So, <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> basically, so w when you look at the fossil record, yeah, you're right, there's only a tiny percentage of what actually lived because the way that fossils are preserved. But um, when we look at the fossil record through time, what we see is very occasionally and associated with sometimes meteorite impacts, the diversity. So the sheer number of species drops dramatically, right? So it's sort of a relative thing. Say you have, we know that there are 100 species at one point in time, okay? And then a meteorite impact happens and that number of species drops to say 10. We know that this extinction event has happened. Yeah. So for example, um the, the crocs I've been studying, uh, towards the end of the Cretaceous, or throughout the whole Cretaceous, I should say, there was over 100 different identified species of crocodile, uh, crocodiliforms just in Gondwana, so just the southern continents of the world, not counting North America and Asia. Um, so it's over 100 just in that time period, just in the bottom half of the world, um, and now there's only 22 species of crocs alive. So. Um, there could have been, you know, a lot more. They wouldn't necessarily be at the same time, either. No, no. So the, 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 the Cretaceous um, spanned from 140 million years ago to about 66 million years ago. So that, what's that? Someone that's good at maths, about 80-odd million years of time. Um, and the actual lineage of a cross, crocs extended back into the Triassic, which was 220-something million years ago. So we're talking about a really long lineage where there was ups and downs throughout its whole history. 
Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, my, my, my final question. Did you hear the one about the cow that was knighted? They called him Sirloin. Like, you know, like, sir, <laughs> like the, the title, but also the cut of beef. Round of applause for our panel, and <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> we'll see you here next time.